This Stealing the Mind Bible Conference presentation is by J.B. Hickson and is entitled The Imminency of the Rapture. For a free catalog of over 250 awesome Bible studies on DVD or CD, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177 or on the web at compass.org. Uh, let's start out by defining imminency precisely. Defining imminency precisely. The term rapture refers to the sudden catching up of believers to meet the Lord in the air and be rescued from this present evil age before the day of the Lord's wrath. Now, that's a mouthful, but it's critical that you get all of those components in there. The sudden catching up of believers to meet the Lord in the air and be rescued from this present evil age before the day of the Lord's wrath. Okay? The rapture. We get the term rapture from uh, Jerome's version of the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where he translates the Greek word harpazo, which means uh, snatching away, with the Latin word rapere. And so that's where we've come up with the name rapture. And uh, so it's the doctrine that the Lord's going to come back to rescue the church from uh, this present evil age prior to the great day of the Lord's wrath. There are several key rapture passages we could look at. Others besides these, but these are some of the more popular ones. The foundational one is 1 Thess 4, 13 to 18, and also Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then John 14 in the upper room, and then as Dr. Woods has mentioned, and as I've also written about 2 Thess chapter 2 is a, perhaps, I think, the key exegetical proof of a pre-tribulational rapture for all of the reasons that uh, Dr. Wood so eloquently discussed uh, in his session today. And then, of course, the blessed hope of Titus 2.13. So let's just look at one of these passages kind of to get us into the frame of mind of talking about the rapture before we go into the term uh, imminence. Uh, 1 Thess 4, 16 and 17, The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. The rapture. Well, when we talk about the term imminence, we, we need to first of all make sure we know what word we're talking about. Uh, having taught eschatology for a number of years, uh, one of the most common uh, mistakes that students make when talking about the subject is they get the word wrong. For example, some people think that we're talking about imminence, which is uh, you know, sort of the inherent, uh, ingrained, or you know, indwelling, and essential nature, but that's not the term that we're talking about. Totally different word. Some people say it's eminence, you know, position of prestige and power and importance and distinction, you know, his eminence, right? Well, that's not the word either. The key word here is imminence, imminence. Imminence. And imminence means any moment or at any time. Any moment or at any time. So when we talk about the imminency of the rapture, what we're talking about is the doctrine that the rapture could happen at any moment. It is the next great prophetic event to which the world looks forward. In other words, there is nothing that must happen prior to the rapture. In other words, the rapture could have happened in Paul's day, or in the early apostles' day, or in the first century, or the second century, or the third century, or the fourth century. The rapture is imminent. There are no prophecies that must be fulfilled prior to the rapture. So if we look at this chart, I'm distinguishing here between the last days and the end times. The last days and the end times. The last days is what the Bible, the term the Bible uses to refer to the present church age. And indeed, if you were to look at our uh, chart on the dispensations out there, which is also on the free literature table, uh, you will see that in the grand scheme of God's plan of the ages, this present age really is the last age prior to the long-awaited coming of the kingdom. Now, there's a lot that's going to happen in that transition. There's a lot of unfulfilled prophecy. There are a lot of things that we love to talk about and that the Bible talks about and teaches about the end times. 
But if you just distill it down to the seven dispensations, this really is the, the last days, and that's what the Bible calls it. The end times, by contrast, refers to all of that eschatological activity beginning with the rapture and culminating in the new heavens and the new earth when the Bible comes full circle from that pre-fall Edenic state in the garden to once again this sinless state in uh, the timeless eternity. So the last days versus the end times. The end times culminates in the kingdom. And notice on the chart there that uh, when we talk about the kingdom, we're talking about both phases of the kingdom. The millennium and the eternal state are often referred to as the new heavens and new earth. Um, a lot of times when you look at dispensational charts, uh, especially of bygone years, we, I think, are a little bit misleading when we refer, refer to the kingdom as the millennial kingdom because it seems to imply that the kingdom is only a thousand years. When in reality, when you look at the biblical data on it and all of the prophecies about it, the kingdom is always said to be an eternal kingdom. Let me give you a couple of quick passages if you want to uh, uh, look this up uh, with me. In, For example, Daniel chapter 7. If you go to Daniel chapter 7, uh, let's see, we can look at, first example, verse 14. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages, and languages should serve him. His dominion is a what? An everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Uh, down in verse 18, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Uh, I guess we could have started uh, back in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, verse 44, which we did a message on this at a, Stealing the Mind a few years ago. Uh, we have a DVD out there. Uh, but if you look in verse uh, 44, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Uh, what about Isaiah chapter 9? If you look over at Isaiah, famous... Uh, passage that we often think of around Christmas time. Um, Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. The government will be, that by the way is referring to the first advent, then in beginning in the second half of verse 6, it, the focus shifts to the second advent and it says the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now watch this, of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. And, and we could come to the New Testament and look at, for example, Luke chapter 1, when uh, Gabriel announces the birth of the Christ child to Mary in Luke 1.31 and says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Watch this. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. So I prefer, and we get into this in our book, What Lies Ahead, to think of the kingdom as an eternal kingdom. The first thousand years of it are of a unique nature that we call the millennium. It's unique because it's on the old heaven, I mean the old earth. It's, it's still bound by time, space, and matter. There's still... Uh, some presence of sin uh, and some among unbelievers who get uh, born into the kingdom later. At the start of the kingdom, there are no unbelievers. Remember, when Christ comes back at the second coming, He separates everybody into two classes of people. The church has already been glorified. We've been raptured at least seven years earlier. We are already in our glorified bodies. We come back with Him, Revelation 19. But among the people on the earth who have survived in their physical bodies the tribulation, that is, they haven't died or been martyred or whatever, there's only two categories, the sheep and the goats. And to the sheep, he says, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Uh, and they enter the kingdom in their physical bodies. To the goats, he says, Depart from me into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. There's no other category. Uh, so at the start of the kingdom, it's all believers, uh, but they will uh, be in their physical bodies, they will procreate, and over time, anyone born in the kingdom, like anyone ever born since Adam, will have to be saved because he's born dead in his trespasses and sins. <laughs> Some of those people will not get saved, such that by the end of the thousand years, 
an, ent- an entire contingent of unbelievers rises up. Satan is released from prison and there's one final battle, the battle of Gog and Magog, which is not the same as the battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And uh, so, you have, so you have some unbelievers in there. But that's the millennium. But then at the end of the millennium you enter the eternal state, but it's all part of the kingdom. It's all part of the kingdom. Okay? Uh, but in contrast to that are the last days, which is the present church age, which is you know, the age in which we are living. And uh, when you look at the rapture of the church on this chart in the green text there, that essentially is the beginning of the end times. It's the next great prophetic event to which the church looks forward. So we're living in the church age. We're looking forward to the end times. Now, we don't know when the rapture is going to happen. But imminency does not mean soon. It means at any moment. And it has always been at any moment. And it could happen at any time. Uh, So we are living in the present age looking for the return of our Lord. Now let's talk about developing imminency historically. What has been the church's view in history about uh, imminency? Developing imminency historically. Well, has the church always expected at any moment return of Christ? Has the church always believed in a two-phased return of Christ? Uh, well, the answer is an emphatic yes. And we can go back and start during uh, the Christ's ministry, and we can see, for example, the earliest reference to the doctrine of the rapture is by Jesus himself in the upper room. Around 33 A.D., he said, I will come again and receive you to myself. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And we see a lot of differences there. Um, So in 33 AD is where we begin to get the idea of the rapture. Now the Holy Spirit revealed it through the Apostle Paul in detail uh, some 18 years later when he wrote the first epistle to the Thessalonians during his second missionary journey. And this is where we read what we said earlier that we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the Lord begins to unveil this mystery of the rapture and it is called a mystery it's called a mystery in 1 Corinthians 15 well what is a mystery mystery is previously unrevealed truth Uh, not something that was newly conceived of by God because God is immutable he never changes it's all part of God's plan Uh, not something that was a plan b you know a lot of times you get the impression when reading uh, replacement theologians that you know God was caught off guard by Israel's rejection thought, what do I do now? And he said, well, I'll just shift my focus over to the church. Uh, And nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, God never looks down from heaven and says, you know, boy, I didn't see that coming. Uh, You know, has it dawned on you that nothing ever dawns on God? Uh, God is sovereign. And the church, as we read in Ephesians 3, was part of God's plan all along. Um, We understand that the Old Testament predicted that he would be a stumbling stone, as someone was talking about earlier today, uh, for Jews and for all people. The gospel... Uh, is definitely an offense uh, to some people. So Paul begins to elaborate on it, and we get some teaching here in 56 A.D. when he wrote 1 Corinthians during his third missionary journey. And then later, in the book of Titus, for example, in 66 A.D., shortly before his death, uh, Paul talks about the blessed hope. And then even as late as 90s A.D., circa 85 to 95, let's say, uh, when uh, John wrote 1 John, written to believers, by the way, uh, to know how to have fellowship with God, Uh, He says, look, when He appears, we want you to remain in fellowship with Him so that you'll be confident when He comes and not ashamed. And he's talking there about the return of the Lord for believers, in fact. Uh, Then as we move forward in church history, we see in the Didache, for example, uh, during the first century time, references to an imminent rapture and the expressions of imminency abound throughout the apostolic fathers. Clement of Rome, Ignatius, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermas, Papias, all uh, talk about a pre-tribulational concept of escaping the great day of the Lord's wrath and, and actually speak of imminency. Uh, if we move further in time, we've got uh, Justin Martyr, Arrhenius, uh, Tertullian, Hippolytus, Cyprian. All of these folks actually speak of imminency in their writings. Uh, the fact that the, the, the rapture could have happened at any moment. Uh, and this is kind of a powerful one. Uh, that uh, my friend and colleague Tommy Ice has uh, talked a lot about and written a lot about in journals. Uh, From 373, Pseudo-Ephraim said, and this is an exact quote, uh, 
Uh, and we don't know the exact time frame. It could have been a little bit later than 373, but I'm tending to lean toward the earlier date. Um, all the saints and elect of God are gathered together before the tribulation, which is to come, and are taken to the Lord. Now, you know, keep this in mind. According to the Bible, at the second coming, Christ comes back to the earth, to the Mount of Olives, to take the throne in the rebuilt temple and rule and reign uh, you know, in the kingdom. But here we are taken to the Lord in order that they may not see at any time the confusion which overwhelms the world because of our sins. And notice that he also actually mentions the word imminent. Later he says, we ought to understand thoroughly, therefore, my brothers, what is imminent or overhanging. So the imminency of the rapture is not a contrived theological doctrine that we've sort of put together among our dispensational study groups. Uh, this is a very much a historic Orthodox view of the church. Now, during the medieval period, between the time of, say, Augustine and, and the Renaissance, uh, you know, they didn't really read the Bible. Uh, and, you know, Augustine's view of an allegorical kingdom sort of took hold and, uh, you know, building upon Origen's teaching and uh, spiritualizing the Bible. And, of course, during that time, you, you weren't allowed to read the Bible. In fact, in many cases, you were burned at the stake if you were caught reading a Bible. And so it's very difficult, though not impossible, to find during the, you know, the medieval period references to a two-phased second coming of Christ, once uh, in an imminent rapture and a second at a predicted time of the second coming. But it's there. And, uh, you know, there are others, and there are scholars that are doing research all the time and uncovering references and, impl Im, you know, implications of a two-phased uh, second coming. Uh, so, remember, uh, the church and during that time was taught as the kingdom. I mean, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church was the kingdom, and so anybody that would teach something different, that the kingdom is yet future and so forth, well, that, those writings were quickly uh, dismissed. But it's certainly there, and I give you a couple of examples of them there with uh, the dates. And then, of course, it's widely known that during the Reformation era, lots of people taught imminency. Uh, in his commentary, John Gill, in 1748, uh, talks about the imminency of the rapture uh, and, and the secret nature of his rapture prior to the judgment that will come upon the whole earth. Um, also, um, Philip Doddridge speaks and uses the term imminency in there. So, uh, the Reformation, and we could go on and on, obviously you get beyond that, you get into Darby, and there's no dispute that, you know, from essentially J. J. and Darby forward, uh, premillennialists have taught the imminency of the rapture and a two-phased coming of Christ, uh, separated by at least seven years. But whenever you read or hear someone who disagrees with our perspective on the end times, suggest that, oh, this is a new doctrine, this is something that was not taught throughout church history or that was made up, that's, you know, a lot of people... You know, there's this, there's this tired old argument going around that's been sufficiently debunked that the rapture was made up, you know, entirely. Um, you, can, you can rest easy that that is simply not the case, and it's frankly tiresome to have to keep pointing out that it is widely taught throughout church history. But, of course, church history is not definitive in forming our doctrine. It's informative, but not definitive. Um, and though sometimes folks from a more Reformed uh, Calvinistic perspective like to appeal to the fathers in some cases more than the Word of God, not all of them, but some of them, we want to be careful not to make the same mistake. We want to defend our view biblically. So let's look at describing imminency biblically. We've looked at defining imminency precisely, developing imminency historically, and now... Let's say, what does the Bible say? And there are many passages in the New Testament that clearly imply imminency. Let's look at a few of these passages. Key passages that imply imminency. Well, you can start with one of my favorites, Maranatha, 1 Corinthians 16, 22. It's a, what we call a hapax legomena, only place it's used in the New Testament. It's an Aramaic word for mar, ana, and tha, meaning Lord or our Lord come, um, and, and it only makes sense to say, O Lord, come. And I, I've got the New King James Version up there, but the literal is Maranatha. It only makes sense for the, the early church to cry, O Lord, come, if they were expecting in any moment or imminent return. If the return of the Lord from the early church's perspective was at a prescribed time following prescribed prophecies, then it would be silly for them to say, O Lord, come, when they know that He's not going to come yet. 
So that's a key passage that implies imminency, but there are many others. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, why would you be eagerly waiting for something if you know that it's not going to happen until a predicted time in sequence with other events? Um, Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for the Savior. I love that passage because it, so, it reminds us, it's like Paul said in Colossians 3, set your mind on things above where Christ is because that, that's where our citizenship is. When we were saved, we were adopted into the family of God. We're just passing through now. You realize you get eternal life when you believe the gospel, not when you die. Do you understand that? A lot of people think, oh, I get eternal life when I die. No, you get eternal life the moment you trust Christ. You're born again, born from above. You're you know, adopted in the family of God, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, regenerated, all these things that happen at that precise moment. And by the way, because you get eternal life, and it is a present possession, Jesus said, I give you eternal life and you shall never perish. Uh, And in the Greek, it's a double negative. You shall no never perish. Uh, Because you get eternal life when you believe, by definition, it can never be lost, which is the reason we believe strongly in eternal uh, security, which I've spoken on here before. But this phrase, eagerly wait, which we've seen a couple of times, is used only seven times in the entire Greek New Testament. Apek dekmai, dekamai actually. Apek dekamai. And it's interesting because as I looked at all of those in preparation for this, every one of the seven, every one of them, always occurs in the context of the rapture. To eagerly wait. It means to expect anxiously, to look forward to something eagerly with hope, to be in a continual state of expectancy. And you can't do that with many of the other prophecies, right? I mean, we all look forward to the time when Christ takes the throne, right? He's going to rule in perfect peace and justice and unprecedented righteousness. He's going to be the prince of peace. All that is so wrong with this world is going to finally be made right. All the dirty, rotten, filthy criminals that get off scot-free are going to, be get, are going to get what's coming to them. All the sad, tragic examples of, of, of people suffering unjustly, that's going to be righted. It's going to be unprecedented peace. The lion's going to lay with the lamb. The baby's going to play by the cobra's prayer. How many of you look forward to that time? Me too. But do you expect it to happen tomorrow? No. So I'm not in a continual state of expectancy for that to happen because I know from reading my Bible how that plays into the end times and when it's going to happen. But seven times apek decamai is used to refer to the rapture and it means eagerly waiting for the Savior. Eagerly waiting for the Savior. Uh, we see in 1 Thess 1 that we are to wait for His Son from heaven who's going to rescue us from the wrath to come. We're going to look at that a little bit later. We already mentioned 1 John 2, 28, that we may have confidence. We should abide in Him so that when He appears, in other words, you know, the exhortation here is to recognize that at some point, at some point, we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. You want to be found walking with the Lord when that happens. Why? Not because, as some people teach, if you're not, you're going to hell. Our home in heaven is eternally secure. Thankfully, we're not saved by works, and we don't need works to prove that we're saved. We're saved by the grace of God. It's a free gift. But because there is going to be a judgment called the Bema Judgment, where we will all stand before the Lord as believers from the church age, the bride of Christ, and be rewarded for our faithfulness. And there will be a moment of regret in that moment. The point is, it implies imminency. Um, you know, keep this command without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. And again, the blessed hope, Titus 2.13, Hebrews 9.28, again, eagerly waiting for Him. And uh, let your gentleness be made known. Long. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. Again, this would make no sense in, 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 outside of the context of the any moment nature of the rapture. Uh, James 5, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Um, and 1 Peter 1.13, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation or the unveiling of Christ. In Revelation, we read several times, I am coming quickly. It's the Greek word takas. It, it, it literally, it's used 15 times in the New Testament. And it, it can mean soon in time relative to another point in time. But not in the context of the rapture and in many other contexts. It means quickly, like in the twinkling of an eye, right? 1 Corinthians 15. That when the rapture happens, it's going to happen like that, quickly, not soon. 
Now, you might be thinking that when we're talking about biblical proofs of imminency, why haven't we mentioned any of the watchfulness passages? And people often point to these passages that tell us to be watchful as proof of imminency. But I'm going to suggest tonight that that's not the best way, exegetically, to prove imminency. And I'll explain why. Let's look at one first, for example. 1 Thess 5, 2. You yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. He goes on to say, let us therefore watch and be sober. Now, that's not a proof of imminency, and here's why. Because the same language is used in other passages, Matthew 24 and 25, to refer to the second coming. So you can be watchful for something that you know is coming at an appointed time. You can be getting ready for it. And indeed, in the tribulation period, what's going to be so amazing is that many Jews, as Jesus talks about in the Olivet Discourse, they're going to once again be deceived and miss the return of Christ. And you might wonder, how in the world could they possibly miss it, given the detailed signs that Jesus unveils throughout the Olivet Discourse? Remember, the whole Olivet Discourse is in answer to the question from the disciples, what will be the sign of your coming? And it's, it's Wednesday night of Passion Week, just hours before he would later be betrayed and arrested and tried. And uh, he had just cursed uh, the temple. He had just announced the woes on the Pharisees. He said the temple's going to, you know, not one stone will be left upon another. This created quite a stir among the disciples who thought that the, the kingdom was going to come immediately, Luke tells us in, in Luke 19, as they were outside of Jerusalem a few days earlier. So they were obsessed with the kingdom. The disciples, they wanted to know who's going to sit where, who's going to rule where. Can, I, can my son sit on either side of you? What are we going to get when we get there, Peter asked. I mean, they wanted to know everything they could about the, the kingdom. And, and Jesus says, you know, wait a minute, it, it's not going to come just yet. And he says the temple's going to be destroyed. Well, the disciples are like, wait a minute, hold the press. What's going on here? Tell us when you're going to come back. And so Jesus says, okay, let me lay it out for you. And in Matthew 24 and 25, he gives the most comprehensive, detailed overview of the end times in one spot in all the Bible. Not, it's not Revelation, it's not Daniel, it's not Ezekiel, it's right there in the Olivet Discourse. And in spite of that, and, and all of the signs, he gives the general signs in the first half of the tribulation, then of course the big sign is the abomination of desolation at the midpoint, and all of these other things. But in spite of that, many will be deceived. Go back and read the Olivet Discourse sometime and see how many times Jesus says, be not be deceived, be not be, de- be not deceived, be not deceived, be not deceived, right? So uh, th- there's going to be many that miss it. So that's why Jesus says, be watchful, be watchful. In other words, keep it in your mind, think about it, focus on it, make it a priority. So we don't want to look at the watchful passages and say those prove imminency, okay? Because the same passages are used, the same terminology is used to refer to the second coming, which is not imminent. Um, So imminency, another way to say this, is imminency is not a primary exegetical proof of pre-tribulationism. In other words, we simply can't just point to watchfulness passages and say, see, that proves that the rapture is pre-tribulational. Or to say it another way, imminency passages, such as they are, and we just went through a bunch of those that imply it, they don't prove pre-tribulationism. Instead, pre-tribulationism demands imminency. Pre-tribulation demands imminency. So we prove the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture of the church, Then we connect all the dots and we say, oh, it must be imminent. It could happen at any time. And that's what we want to do here in this last section. So we've defined imminency precisely. We've developed imminency historically and described imminency biblically with these passages. But now let's make it clear. Let's connect the dots. Let's demonstrate imminency theologically. And I think there are five steps to proving unequivocally the imminency of the rapture. Five steps to proving unequivocally the imminency of the rapture. And and it begins by demonstrating, first of all, that all the signs scripturally regarding the end times, remember my chart, end times versus last days, all the end times prophecies relate to Daniel's 70th week or later. Let me say that again. This may be something that you haven't really thought about in quite this way before. When you look at the grand scheme of end times prophecies, all of them, and there are many, All of them relate to Daniel's 70th week or later in terms of the Old Testament uh, prophecies. So uh, let's take a look. First of all, uh, as we we look at this chart, so there's the first step. All of these end times prophecies relate to Daniel's 70th week. So here's Daniel's 70th week. 
And as we look through the end times prophecies, we see that there are no prophecies of the Old Testament that will be fulfilled during the church age. And how could there be? The church age is a mystery. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament. So you can't, you can't go back into the Old Testament, which doesn't even mention the, the church, and start pulling out prophecies that relate to the church age, because all of them relate to, the, to, to Daniel's 70th week or later. Or later. So here we are over in the church age, and, and we've got to get past the church age before we can begin to see the fulfillment of prophecy. And that leads us to the rapture. In our Daniel 70th week chart, we demonstrate that Daniel's prophecy allows for, in fact demands, a gap of time between the 69th and 70th weeks of Daniel. The first 483 years were fulfilled historically. There's a gap of time according to Daniel's prophecy. And then at some point in the future, that final seven year period will be fulfilled. And we are currently living right now in between the 69th and 70th weeks of Daniel. But um, we, do, we simply do not have any prophecies or events that will take place during the church age that are predicted in the Old Testament. So some people might say, well, what about 1948? I mean, surely that was predicted in the Old Testament. Be careful, because if we say that 1948 had to happen before the rapture can happen, then that means that up until, you know, from 1947 and earlier, nobody could have expected the rapture. With, you with me? See, now, now here's where I'm going to kind of probably get myself in trouble, but I, I just want you to think with me theologically. You've got to run everything through the grid of Scripture. And, you, and I know that in this group of Bereans you do that, and we may still not agree, but I want you to at least think through it, not through the lens of what we've always heard, but through what does the Bible say. Hypothetically, what do we know? We know that Israel has to be a nation in order for the Antichrist to sign a peace treaty. We know that Israel has to be a nation with the temple rebuilt for the Antichrist to set up himself as God and be worshipped. We know all of these things about Israel and all of them relate to what? 70th week of Daniel or later. Does Israel have to be a nation prior to the rapture according to biblical prophecy? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. God could have allowed the rapture to happen in the year 1400. And then Israel could have become a nation after that. Notice uh, on the chart there I've got a, a time of preparation in here. Um, that's because the rapture is a different event from the signing of the peace treaty which begins the seven year tribulation. They can't happen at the same time. So by definition there must be at least some time between them. And I believe that there are some things that happen after the rapture that are predicted in the Old Testament such as Ezekiel 38 and 39 and I go into that in my sequential order of end times events, uh, that set the stage even further. And hypothetically, uh, that's when Israel could have become a nation quickly, and there could have been an attack on Israel. Anything could happen. Now, do you, if you ask me, do I think that 1948 was prophetically significant? Absolutely, I think it was prophetically significant. I think the time is short. I think the Lord's going to return in our lifetime. And I think all of this is the setting of the stage. If you picture human events as sitting in a theater and uh, there's a big red curtain there and uh, you're getting ready for the play to start and you can see light peeking out from underneath the curtain and you can hear furniture being shifted around and props being put in place and anticipation is building and you can't wait for that curtain to rise. But you don't really know what kind of, what kind of events are happening that are going to relate and be prepared for the end times. All we can say with certainty is that the stage is being set. And certainly it looks like, by all accounts, that the stage is ready to be, it has been set and the, and the curtain is ready to rise. So if you ask me to speculate, and you ask me what do I, what's my gut telling me, absolutely. But if you ask me what can I prove scripturally, hypothetically, and I hesitate to even say this because some of you, you'll remember this only and then you're going to email me and tell me how much you don't like me, but hypothetically and theologically Israel could disappear from our maps for another thousand years before God brings the church home and then you know comes back so when will we know with certainty whether or not 1948 or any other stage setting event that's happening in the present age was in fact prophetically significant after the rapture after the rapture so again, I, I certainly think it's pretty clear all of this is coming together, but I can't point to an Old Testament passage 
and say this was fulfilled in 1200, this was fulfilled in 1948, this was fulfilled in 1967, this was fulfilled in 1971. You know, I can't, I can't do that because there are no Old Testament prophecies that are predicting things that will happen prior to the rapture because the rapture is imminent. Secondly, we prove the seal judgments take place at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. So step one is we, say, we demonstrate that all Old Testament prophecies relate to Daniel's 70th week or later. Then we say, well, the seal judgments of Revelation chapter 6 constitute the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. So we don't have time to go through all of these, uh, but let me just put the chart up. It's uncanny when you compare uh, the Olivet Discourse with the first six seal judgments. Remember, the seventh seal judgment is the unveiling of seven trumpet judgments, so it's really six specific judgments. And what do we find? Well, the first one is the unveiling of the Antichrist. That corresponds to the rider on the white horse. Um, and Jesus talked about Antichrist. He talked about war. Then we see the second seal is war and famine and death and martyrdom, the cries of the martyr in the fifth seal. So it seems obvious that these seal judgments begin at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. In fact, the first seal judgment is the unveiling of the Antichrist. And according to 2 Thess 2 and Daniel 9, 27, we won't know who the Antichrist is until he signs the peace treaty. He, he could be alive, or certainly a candidate for the Antichrist is alive today. Um, but, uh, you know, and we'll be, we'll be watching from heaven, perhaps, after the rapture. And, you know, we're all going to be looking with bated breath to see who signs that treaty. And then we're going to go, see, I told you it was him. And, no, I told you it was him. And, I knew it, I knew it was him. And, um, which, by the way, if you want to know, I know who the Antichrist is going to be. God revealed it to me in a bowl of spaghetti. So... <laughs> For a donation of any kind to Not By Works, we will be glad to privately reveal that to you. Um, no, I'm just kidding, obviously. Um, but so the seal judgments begin at the beginning of uh, the tribulation. You know, we have the rider on the white horse. Uh, the Antichrist is unveiled at that time. Uh, we again, 2 Thess 2, the man of sin is revealed at that time. Um, and the, Daniel chapter 9, he's going to confirm a covenant with one time. Thirdly, we say the seal judgments comprise, and this is important, the prophetic wrath of God. The seal judgments themselves are the prophetic wrath of God because we've got to be able to prove that the wrath of God comprises the whole seven years. Okay, uh, So it's pretty clear when you read Revelation chapter 6 during the seal judgments, they're crying out, hide us from the wrath for the great day of His wrath has come. Right? Jesus Himself, referring to the seven-year tribulation, even uses the word wrath. And calls it a time of wrath. And that's the Old Testament reference to this seven year tribulation period. Zephaniah, for example, calls it the great day of the Lord. The day uh, is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, and so on and so forth. So, finally, we've said all end times prophecies relate to the time of Daniel's 70th week or later. The seal judgments take place at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. The seal judgments comprise the prophetic wrath of God. And now we have to prove one other thing for the rapture to be imminent, that the church is exempt from the prophetic wrath of God. And that brings us back to 1 Thess 1.10, where we are told that Jesus will deliver us from the wrath to come. That God not, has not appointed the church to wrath, but to obtain deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ, salvation. In fact, uh, many people have pointed out that in Revelation chapter 4, we see... Um, a veiled reference perhaps to the rapture. I don't think you can prove this exegetically, uh, but it is interesting that after Revelation chapter 3, you see no more references to the church. Uh, this is my chart of the book of Revelation. Uh, it's actually, Revelation is one of the easiest books in the Bible to outline. It's not complicated at all. Uh, it's a, one of Satan's many lies that he convinces people, oh, I don't want to study the end times, it's too confusing. Um, it's only confusing because you haven't read What Lies Ahead. So... Um, <laughs> But if you see in chapters 2 and 3, you know, he's the letters to the churches. Chapters 4 and 5 are a theodicy. What gives God the right to pour out his wrath? Oh, just the fact that the Lamb of God shed his blood to take away the sin of the world. Uh, and then you start with the tribulation in 6 through 18 with some, you know, supplemental information sprinkled uh, in there. Um, but clearly... Um, the, the church will not be a part of the prophetic wrath of God. And that being the case, the rapture must occur prior to the start of Daniel's 70th week. And if 
all of Daniel 70 of the week kind of is the end times and forward. And the church won't be in that. And we've got to be rescued before that. Then what we can say is there's no signs for the rapture. We don't have to say, well, the rapture can't happen until this happens or this happens or this happens. The rapture is the next sign. Does that make sense? The rapture is the next sign. So we prove the, pre, the, 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 the pre-tribulationism biblically and exegetically, and then we derive theologically the doctrine of eminence. Now, I'm going to close by leaving you this story here. Uh, this is a, a placard that uh, was on my grandparents' door growing up. My grandfather was a preacher. He's the one that helped me develop my passion for the end times, and I dedicated the book What Lies Ahead to him. But I remember visiting them, and every time we would go to their house, wherever they lived, Tennessee or Texas or wherever, they had this little packet. I still have it. It's tattered and torn. Um, But it said this, To whom it may concern, the believers of this household are looking for the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. When it returns, when it occurs, it will suddenly be discovered that thousands of people are missing, and this home will be found empty. Then may you realize that the true Christian church has been taken out of this world, an event of which the Apostle Paul wrote so clearly in 1 Thess 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. It will mean that Christ has called His people, those who are saved by grace through faith in Him, to ever be with the Lord. Do not search for us. We will return with Christ after the seven years of tribulation spoken of in Revelation chapter 6 to 18, when He comes to judge the Antichrist and take the throne of His father David as promised Him. In the meantime, do not weep for us, for we are finally home. We have this same placard hanging in our house right by our front door. Now, if you believe in imminence, as the Bible teaches it, you should have something similar hanging in your house. You should be prepared that at any moment, maybe tonight on our way home, we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And what will those left behind do? What will they think? Will they wonder? Will they know? And once again, the reason uh, that this subject is so important is because there are those, perhaps even in this room, who aren't ready for the rapture. And if the Lord were to come back tonight, are you prepared to meet Him? Don't leave here tonight without settling the issue of the gospel. It's very simple. We are a sinner in need of a Savior. It's not complicated. It's not some contract between you and God. It's not something you have to promise or pledge or make a deal with God and get it all ready, get cleaned up so you can take a bath. You simply receive simply, humbly, in childlike faith the free gift of salvation paid for by the blood of Christ, our Savior. And if you'd like more information about that, I'd love to uh, talk with you about that before we leave. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the Blessed hope, the great hope that we have in the return of our Savior to rescue us from this present evil age. And Father, I pray if there's one here today within the sound of my voice that doesn't know you, that your Spirit would convict them of their sin and the penalty of sin and their need for a Savior. And that today they would receive by faith the gift of eternal life. Lord, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This has been The Imminency of the Rapture, presented by J.B. Hickson. To receive a free catalog of over 250 awesome Bible studies on DVD or CD, all using and defending a literal translation of the Bible, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach and trips to Israel, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177, 24 hours a day, or visit us on the web at compass.org.